Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, board's work session for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. It's four o'clock and I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, the first item on our agenda is uh, public comment, but I want to first let everyone know that uh, we're sending out a reminder to alternates and directors to please register for the 2024 Dr. Cog board retreat taking place on April 26th and 27th this year. Um, you should have received a reminder already in the mail and Melinda will drop a link into the chat now in case you missed that. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Melinda, Doug or me if you need any more information about that. Um, next item on our agenda is public comment. Melinda, can you tell if there's anyone online, any, any uh, public that would like to comment? Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll give it just one moment to see if anyone needs to raise their hand for public comment. Okay, um, it looks like uh, our first one would be Chris Miller. I'll go ahead and unmute uh, them now so they can speak. You're with the Board of Directors. Please go ahead. Chris? Muted? Possibly muted. Um, we'll, we'll real quick just send a message to him that if you can unmute, uh, we'll take your comment. Um, but in the meantime, are there is there anyone else online? Uh, yes, it looks like we do have several hands that are raised. Um, I'll go ahead and message Chris. But in the meantime, uh, our next speaker will be Jonathan Singer. Uh, so they should be allowed to speak now. Good afternoon. Go ahead. All right. Th thank you, Commissioner. I I'm Jonathan Singer. I'm the Senior Director of Policy Programs with the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. We are also merged with uh, Boulder Transportation Connections, our regional transportation management organization for the city of Boulder. And the reason I wanted to stop by today is we saw on your agenda today is a discussion of the regional housing needs assessment. And uh, as you know, House Bill 1313 is making its way through the Colorado General Assembly. This is the bill that refers to transit oriented communities. Now in Boulder, as you may or may not know, uh, the average price of a three bedroom, 2000 square foot home is about a million dollars. Uh, that price is a lot of us out of it, including myself. And while the city has taken dramatic steps to make sure that density is taken into account and that new affordable housing requirements are put in place, we can't do this alone. Uh, we need a broad solution that looks at this like a statewide matter of concern should be. So I'm gonna give you one brief story and one brief statistic. Uh, so the statistic is this, um, in the city of Boulder on a typical Monday through Friday pre-COVID, we nearly doubled our population just by having our workforce come into our community. That's a lot of wear and tear on a state highway, US 36 primarily, and highway 93. At the same time, what we're hearing internally is we're hearing about businesses that are pulling up stakes and leaving, uh, healthcare facilities that are saying, Jonathan, we have enough patients. We even have enough doctors and nurses, but they can live further away for less money and work other places. And that's where we're going. So now we're not even able to take care of our own population who happens to be aging. So looking at the wear and tear on our roads, that the state is subsidizing, looking at our own individual needs, we need a regional solution. So we're imploring groups like Dr. Cog to step up to the plate with our TMO, with the Boulder Chamber and other business leaders uh, to work towards a workable solution like House Bill 13, uh, excuse me, like House Bill 1313 to ensure that not only our economic vibrance, but our own community members can live closer to, uh, work closer to home and live in the communities that they oftentimes grew up in, but are being priced out of. So we look forward to sticking around for the conversation today and see how things go. And please do not hesitate to reach out to me um, anytime I can be reached once again through the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jonathan. 
Melinda, do we have anyone other any other public comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, my apologies. Um, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to try and go back to Chris Miller at this time to see if maybe they're able to unmute now. Uh, how does this work now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Got, <laughs> take a minute, please. Zoom. Zoom decided to fiddle with my audio settings. Sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Miller. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Chris Miller. I'm a resident of Denver and a member of YMB Denver. Uh, like the previous speaker, uh, I'm also here to speak in support of House Bill 24-13-13, and in particular, why Dr. Cog um, should uh, support the, the direction that this is going. And the choices made at each city impact each city, and Dr. Cog exists because it recognizes that reality and you know works to coordinate across the region. Housing affordability is the same way. Uh, the impact of housing affordability does not stop at the city of Denver's borders. Um, uh, but your ability as an organization is somewhat limited. You can encourage more home building in each city, but you can't bind each city. You know, why should Lakewood or Boulder make changes if um, another city in the region is reluctant to uh, encourage more home building in in their municipality? And yet we all depend on each other and share the roads and the infrastructure which connects each city. Uh, House Bill 24, 13, 13 solves this problem in the way that asks the least of each city. Transit-oriented communities make the most effective use of existing infrastructure. Uh, it requires the, the least land. Um, it uh, has the, the smallest impact on each city and gives each city the most flexibility to uh, grow together as a region, as we have been doing and uh, without losing the character of each individual municipality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. We appreciate your comments. Melinda, is there anyone else? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our uh, next speaker will be Jonathan Singer. I'll go ahead and allow them to speak now. We just, I think we heard from him in the- Oh. That, that's my fault, my, my apologies. Uh, no. Okay, uh, then the next one will be uh, Jason Schaefer. Mr. Right, Schaefer. There. Yep. You have three minutes, Mr. Schaefer. All right, yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Um, my name is Jason Schaefer. I'm a, a master's in urban planning student. <clears throat> I got something in my throat right in my talking. I, I'm a master's in urban and regional planning student at CU Denver. Uh, so I, one thing that's interesting is I'm actually, uh, for my capstone, I'm studying something called the Grand Boulevards, which is essentially um, doing a lot of housing and upzoning along arterial corridors. And that the research I've been doing for that project um, really ties into this bit, the House Bill uh, 1313 quite a bit. And one of the pieces of research that's been really helpful for me is actually looking at Dr. Cog's um, uh, Metro Vision 2050. And particularly, there was a, um, a strict, uh, uh, like a scenario planning memo, a technical memo that was done as part of that. And in that memo, it really does uh, sort of reinforce why uh, Bill 1313 transit oriented communities is, is really important and makes sense. Um, in those scenarios that Dr. Cog ran, um, you know, they tested like, okay, what if we do some infill? What if we do some HOV lanes? What if, you know, these different strategies? And what they found is, to, to reduce congestion, to reduce travel delay, to reduce greenhouse gases, to meet those targets that we have in the long term. Um, none of the strategies on their own really worked. What worked, the only one that got, got us there was um, if you combine increased transit with increased in, in an increase in compact development, increase in infill. That's what got us there. And, and what's interesting is through my research, looking at other similar types of studies from around the country and even around the world, it's usually the same thing. Uh, you, to, to, make the, to make it work and reach these long-term goals, you need both the compact development and you need the transportation. And 
What I like about 1313 is that it's addressing both of those in tandem um, while not really doing a lot of disruption with, with communities character and giving communities a lot of choice and kind of how they, you know, how, how they do this, which I, which I think is really important because every community is different. So um, yeah, I'd encourage um, Dr. Cog to support 1313. And I, I think it really uh, aligns well with, um, you know, with the regional transportation plan and, and Dr. Cog's goals. And like I said, the model supports this very well, which, which is nice to see. So that's all I had, but I appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Um, Melinda, anybody else? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm so sorry about the clock. For some reason, it's okay. screwing up on my end. Um, it looks like our next speaker uh, will be Connor, and I will give them permissions to speak. Good Good afternoon, Connor. We're, you're on with the uh, Dr. Cog Board of Directors. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Connor. I'm a human services case manager and a YIMBY organizer. I'm reaching out to you today because I strongly urge you to support House Bill 1313. It is abundantly clear that Colorado is in the middle of a housing crisis and the vast majority of Coloradans not just believe that the cost of renting or buying a home is a serious problem, but they experience it every single day. The state is simply becoming far too expensive for regular people and young folks like myself, we struggle to afford rent and buying a home just seems utterly impossible for us. And for older generations, our seniors are getting pushed out and that's of multiple things. They're getting pushed out of the cities that they grew up in. They could be getting pushed out of the state or even out of retirement just to keep up with housing costs. And this splits up our families and friends. It makes us live farther away. It increases the strain on our highways, traffic, and it increases our overall emissions. HB 1313 will help our communities build more housing near transit and areas of opportunity to bring down overall housing costs, create more livable, sustainable, and walkable communities so that people can afford to stay in Colorado. I read a little bit about your vision, Metro vision for 2050, and I do believe that House Bill 1313 is one of the best ways that we can secure a strong future for every Coloradan, but also it alleviates the material conditions of Coloradans right now. As I said, I'm a human services case manager, and I see this on a daily basis. One of the biggest issues that our clients face is the cost of housing, and I actively work with clients who were forced out because they could not afford rent anymore, or the direct cash assistance they were receiving simply didn't keep up with the cost of rents. And there are clients that I have that are just living on the streets trying to get by. To, in order to have more transit and more opportunity and cheaper housing for these people, I strongly urge you to support House Bill 1313. And also, thank you for what you do and your time for me today. We appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Melinda, who's next? My apologies, my computer's not working with me today. Um, our next speaker will be Molly McKinley and I'll allow her to speak now. Great. Good afternoon, Molly. Good afternoon. I feel like I'm on a, a very popular radio show right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and thanks so much for the time. Um, I'm Molly McKinley. I'm the policy director for the Denver Streets Partnership where we advocate for the cultural and systemic changes necessary to reduce Denver's unsustainable dependence on cars and design communities that put people first, which is why I'm here joined by a number of other folks today um, asking the Dr. Cog board to take a supportive position on House Bill 1313, Housing and Transit Oriented Communities. As you well know, land use and transportation are inexplicably linked. Housing and transportation are the two top household costs for most families right now in Colorado. Right now, many Coloradans have no other option than to drive to their daily destinations, including those who must live a significant distance from those destinations because of a lack of affordable housing, um, as Jonathan mentioned earlier. We're strongly supportive of the opportunities that this bill allows for more dense housing to be built around transit corridors across the region and the state, um, and hope you are as well. Given Colorado's climate and air quality goals, we must significantly reduce vehicle miles traveled. Increasing housing options near transit stations and job centers, as this bill does, is critical to reducing VMT. House Bill 1313 offers a clear opportunity to advance the goals set by this body. 
It also stands to improve the lives of folks here in the Denver region who are currently cost burdened by housing and transportation costs, as well as those who experience the health impacts of our current car dependent system. I urge you to support House Bill 1313 and thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you very much, Molly. Linda, who's next? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next speaker will be uh, Matt Fromer, so I will allow them to speak now. Good afternoon, Matt. You're with the Board of Directors. You have three minutes. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Cog Board members. My name is Matt Fromer, and I work on transportation, land use, and climate policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP. As you consider the next steps on your regional housing needs assessment, I urge you to support current legislative efforts to create more housing opportunities near transit and eliminate barriers to creating walkable mixed use communities like costly and excessive parking mandates. Both of these bills, House Bill 1313 and House Bill 1304, align with Dr. Cog's 2050 Metro vision and its performance measures to increase housing near rapid transit, protect open space by supporting infill, develop urban centers, reduce vehicle miles traveled and single occupancy vehicle trips, and cut greenhouse gas emissions. Speaking of climate, Dr. Cog's 2022 Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan, the one used to comply with the state's greenhouse gas planning standard, relies heavily, heavily on land use strategies like TOD, infill, and parking reform to meet the regional greenhouse gas reduction targets. These bills present a perfect opportunity for Dr. Cog to follow through on those greenhouse gas savings by supporting local governments as they identify their own transit-oriented communities and adopt affordable housing policies and infrastructure plans to enable more housing production. This year's bill, TOC 2.0, is a better version of last year's Senate Bill 213 because it has more flexibility and more funding, a direct result of months and months of stakeholder meetings between bill sponsors and local governments, planners, advocates, and others. Compared to last year's bill, House Bill 1313 gives cities and counties more flexibility to meet their transit housing goals, wherever and however it makes the most sense for their communities, striking an appropriate balance between state action and local control. It also brings new money to the table to support the production of affordable housing near transit and help communities upgrade their infrastructure, one of the biggest barriers to TOD. Many communities already meet the bill's zoning capacity targets, and for them, this bill means more state support to bring local TOD plans to fruition. It also means that everyone in the region will do their part to provide their fair share of housing opportunities rather than relying on a subset of communities to solve what is inherently a regional challenge. Public transit has enormous potential to cut pollution, but only when we combine it with smart land use and density. We've learned this the hard way in the Denver metro area, where despite investing almost $7 billion over 20 years in expanded rail, our system has struggled to generate high ridership, even before the pandemic. Peer transit agencies in Portland, Minneapolis, and Seattle moved two to four times as many riders per mile as RTD. The key missing ingredient here is density. According to a recent analysis, 90% of the rail stations and 84% of the bus routes subject to this bill do not meet the threshold threshold for transit supportive density. Lastly, I urge you to support the parking reform bill, House Bill 1304, which will remove local parking mandates and instead allow builders and local businesses to right size their parking supply to meet the needs of their residents and customers. To be clear, removing parking mandates will not get rid of new parking. And we have plenty of evidence from communities here in Colorado that in the absence of parking minimums, developers I will think continue to, to wrap up your comments, please. Okay. Um, in closing, I'll just say that these two bills, the transient to community bills and the park reform bills, are some of the most impactful policies we can adopt to address the housing affordability and climate crises. And I urge you to consider all the benefits they could provide for your communities and for the Dr. Cog region. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Melinda, do we have any more callers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, we do not have anyone else for public comment. Great. Thank you very much for your help during that. And we, as always, we appreciate public comments and uh, we will uh, have those be part of our, our summary. Um, speaking of which, that's our next item on our agenda is to, um, I just want to ask if everyone had a chance to review the summary of February 7th, 2024 board work session. And if there are any changes that any of the directors would like to make. 
And Melinda, I'm not sure I'd see any hands raised on my um, system here today. Uh, I, I agree with you. I don't see any hands raised as well. Okay. Those minutes will stand uh, as, uh, as they've been published. Next item is our main event of the evening, is an update on the regional housing needs assessment that we began back in September. And I'm going to recognize Sheila Lynch, Director of Regional Planning and Development. Ms. Lynch. Thank you, Chair Baker. Um, so delighted to be with all of you today and to bring an update to you on our regional housing needs assessment. Before we jump into the presentation, I wanted to just provide a little bit of context, hopefully a refresher to our board directors who have been with us for some time and, and a little bit of background for our new board directors. We kicked off our regional housing needs assessment in September of 2023. Um, our consultants wasted no time in diving deep into our phase one, which was our data analysis. We had an initial en um, engagement with our member government staff in November, and then we provided an update to the board at the January board work session. And then over the last six weeks, we have hosted many meetings and conversations as a part of phase two to better understand the systemic barriers to addressing housing need. We estimate that we have connected with over 150 stakeholders in the last six weeks, and you'll hear more about what we've learned when our consultants provide the update. We'll be finishing up our regional housing needs assessment by June, and we'll have a full re report to you then. And I just wanted to take time to thank our staff and our consultants because we have accomplished a lot in just a, a few short months. And so wanted to just acknowledge all the work that's gone into this assessment up to this point. So I will pass it on to Tyler Bump. He is a principal with Echo Northwest who serves as our lead consultant for the regional housing needs assessment. Tyler, take it away. Thank you, Sheila. Um, good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is Tyler Bump. I'm a partner project director at Echo Northwest and have been had the distinct pleasure of working with um, Sheila, the Dr. Cog team, um, Doug, um, on this work and stakeholders over the past few months. It really has been uh, a, a dash and lots of really good work that we've done as a whole team and as a community coming together to, to, to work on this regional housing needs assessment. Um, and thank you, Melinda, for getting the cameras on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to give you a quick overview, as Sheila mentioned today, of some of um, where we where we've been on the project, where we're heading, and an update on our barriers analysis of that we're working on right now. Um, here's a little bit of a timeline, a graphic timeline for you all. We've been working on this since about October, November of last year, and we we kicked off the project. We've visited with you a couple of times, had a bunch of engagement, and been working through the technical analysis. We are now in our um, barriers and strategies phase, moving through April and May. Uh, we have a uh, regional housing needs assessment report that we will be publishing um, this month. There's a lot of information in there. So if there's stuff from our greatest hits that you want to learn more about in the report that we talked about today, feel free to visit that report as well. Next slide, please. Um, so our agenda for today, um, review the key findings from the regional housing needs assessment. Um, again, this is like a greatest hits, a sort of high level pieces here. Um, setting the stage for the barriers conversation and to um, revisit some of those key findings from the last conversation that we had with you all in January. Um, give a summary of our engagement to date. Start to uh, frame up the way that we're thinking about systemic barriers um, and some of the categories that I think we're going to want to keep consistent uh, with you all moving forward into um, the strategy development as Dr. Cog works on the strategies. Um, have a little bit of discussion. We've got some questions to prompt for you all to get your feedback and, and direction on some of these things, and then talk about next steps. Next slide, please. Um, so a review of the key findings. Next slide. Um, the big number as we talk about it, our long-term target of regional housing needs by 2050, we're looking at a total need of about 511,000 new units by 2050. Um, one of the things that we've done through this work is to think about a 10-year target. So the short-term target of about 216,000 units by 2033, 
one of the reasons that we want to focus on a, a near-term target as part of this work is to think about something that's um, actionable in the near term and how some of the strategies can be developed and deployed in a way um, from Dr. Cog, Cog and with um, member governments and stakeholders and community partners around moving towards that goal. Um, one of the things that you'll see in our in our report um, when you when that's published, you take a look at it, is in that 10-year total, we are really thinking about how to prioritize um, need for those that are the most vulnerable in the communities um, in which we live and work in this first 10 years, um, and then thinking a little bit longer term around need more broadly through the 2050 uh, planning horizon. Um, one note, about 137,000 units, uh, about 64% of that 10-year need will be for low-income uh, households, so households that are earning below 60% area median income. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we've done is define um, the household incomes um, and the, the affordability levels for the housing needed through 2050. And this shows this, this distribution of um, housing needed at 0 to 60% AMI on the far left, and then above 120% AMI on the far right as the whole spectrum of housing needs. Um, again, that 0 to 60% number uh, is about a little over half of the need through 2050 and represents low-income households. And um, really some intervention, government intervention, both a regulatory intervention in many cases and financial support and subsidy to be able to make that 0 to 60% AMI um, feasible and possible within the market. On that 120% AMI level and above, that's really more of the um, sort of market rate housing that is needed across the region, both today and into the future. And in the middle, this this um, moderate income household and, and more of that sort of workforce housing in the 80% through 120% AMI categories. And the overall story here is that there's a lot of housing that's needed, needed across all income categories. But while these are big numbers, they're also achievable. A lot of the development trends that we've seen in the Denver region over the last 10 years is consistent with these trends that we're seeing. The difference is, is that the region needs to think about um, meeting these housing needs more distributed throughout the region, making sure that there's all pockets of the region are building the housing need that meets the needs of their communities and that different income categories are thought about throughout our housing planning so that jurisdictions and governments throughout the region are thinking about how to meet this need from lowest income, housing for the homeless, supportive services, um, all the way up through market rate housing over the next 40 years here. Next slide, please. Um, one of the more interesting things that I think, um, and innovative things, frankly, that we've done here with Dr. Cog um, is looking at these regional submarkets. And so we've looked at a bunch of different data um, uh, in the housing market, where folks live, where they commute to, to define these submarkets about how housing markets function um, throughout the region. One of the most interesting ones um, for me, thinking about some of the work that we've been doing in Boulder County with the cities of uh, Louisville and Superior recently, specifically, is how some of the communities in Boulder County are connected to some of the more of the uh, communities on the north end of the Front Range along the I-5 corridor in Thornton, for example in terms of this jobs housing balance and housing affordability and options across the region. So just an example of how we're thinking about and, and evaluating and doing the analysis on these submarkets. Again, there's a, a housing need across all of these categories for the most part. It's the, the four sort of closer in submarkets within the region. Um, that west submarket really does represent some more of the um, smaller communities in the foothills and the mountains. Um, there is a uh, need in, in that West area as well, um, a lot related to workforce housing and affordable housing, especially in some of those communities that are um, more entertainment, recreation, destination related as well, tourism related, um, but a lot of needs across all income categories, across all submarkets within the region here. Next slide, please. Um, some key findings from the interim report, um, housing production, as I mentioned, has largely kept pace with population growth. Uh, but also is happening in the context of historic underproduction. So uh, there's been housing housing production that's been happening at a rate that's that's similar to household growth um, and in migration that's happening, household formation that's happening in the region. But that's not enough to overcome historic underproduction. And as we mentioned earlier, that housing production isn't happening across all income categories as well. Uh, low income households, those below 60% area median income, represent the greatest need for additional housing, both in the next 10 years and through that 2050 forecast period that we're looking at. Um, aging population and smaller household trends will re require more diverse housing types. So across the region, we're seeing um, increasingly smaller household sizes over time, and that has to do with both 
um, younger households and household formation, household sizes on, on the younger end of the spectrum, as well as aging adults and what housing needs look like for aging adults. So thinking about how that shifting of age cohorts happens across the region and how we're planning for housing across the Denver region. Um, and housing types and affordability are unevenly distributed across the region. When we're starting to look at um, sort of jurisdictional level or submarket level, we see uh, parts of the region that have a higher share of naturally occurring affordable housing that maybe it's it's really important to think about um, preservation of affordable housing, of naturally occurring affordable housing in those communities. We heard from some of the folks in the public comment period earlier today around some of the housing challenges um, in Boulder County specifically and around workforce development and, and workforce attraction. And some of those things um, are not evenly distributed across the region. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is leading us into our barriers conversation. I'm going to spend a couple slides here talking about some things that came up at the beginning of the project, our project team has talked about, and generally what we know from the policy environment conversations in the Denver region, and then move on to what we're hearing um, as part of the engagement work in the barriers phase that we're in right now. Um, assessing barriers to housing production, uh, barriers can operate at various levels uh, across the region, interact in very complex ways, and vary in significance, impact, and dynamics. Um, these five categories right here, I want you to sort of like, I want these to sink in as we go through because this is going to be the framework that we're talking about barriers and our strategies moving forward. Um, the first category being zoning, land use, and regulatory process barriers. Um, second, construction and finance barriers. Third, infrastructure barriers. Um, fourth, ongoing funding for below market rate housing, the lack of overall um, funding availability for below market rate housing and deeply affordable housing. And then uh, lastly, political will and collective action barriers. Next slide, please. And so here's these categories with some examples of some, some uh, specific barriers that have come up in uh, early conversations. And we've talked a lot about um, on the zoning, land use, and regulatory process um, side of things, um, mostly zoning across the region for a narrow range of housing types. Um, different communities have... Um, different allowances. We've seen different development trends for different housing types across the region, but generally narrow bands of oftentimes either uh, detached single family housing or larger multifamily housing and not a lot happening in between of those housing type categories. Um, exclusively commercial zones, um, which has a fiscal component that we'll talk to talk about in a little bit here, um, but a lot of commercial zoning, especially across corridors, commercial corridors throughout the region. Uh, permitting and procedures, talk a little bit about um, the process for development review and permit applications, and then flat rate impact fees. Flat rate impact fees being the same impact fees on a per unit basis for a larger detached home, for as, as you might see for a smaller multifamily house or some other um, less expensive housing type that's desirable from a policy standpoint. Um, construction and finance, um, shortage of construction labor, we're hearing pretty consistently and has been a long time challenge for the Denver region and, and communities across the West is having enough labor to meet demand for housing production. Um, rising costs of construction and financing, especially over the last nine months, 12 months or so, um, as interest rates have escalated and remained relatively high and, and the sort of lending costs are high and, and construction uh, costs are high as a result of that as well. Um, infrastructure, um, some of the things that we've we've heard about at the beginning of the project, long-term water availability, uh, infrastructure requirements and limited uh, funding for infrastructure expansion, funding capacity, limited state funding, not enough tax credit capacity, um, ceilings on private activity bonds, regional and local funding sources limited, not able to meet the needs, um, political will and collective action, um, general attitudes and perception towards development um, across communities in the region, um, and regional coordination on where to build. Um, like I said, there's been some disparate sort of distribution of housing and where that's been built over the last development cycles as well. Next slide, please. So some update on what we're hearing, focus conversations are phase one of engagement. We had two uh, larger focus groups, the first one with uh, member governments and land use and planning and housing staff. So a lot of your staff have attended those focus groups that we've talked to, and then climate and sustainability groups um, as part of this first round of conversations. Uh, both of these focused on key barriers to development and Dr. Cog's role. How can Dr. Cog help support housing production for a wider range of household and income needs across the region? Um, member governments also discuss the needs by AMI and how they think about housing affordability across incomes differently. Um, the climate group also discussed challenges and priorities at the intersection of housing and sustainability. So thinking about housing, transportation access, efficiency and sustainability related to both the form and the type of housing, as well as the location of housing um, and access to services and amenities throughout the region. 
Um, some focus conversations on phase two. As Sheila mentioned, we have been just running full speed on community engagement over the last month. Uh, we've talked to infrastructure professionals, housing developers, housing finance professionals. We spoke with the Home Builders Association last week, um, had a group of small conversation, focus group with regional economists, uh, member government planning staff, housing advocates and service providers, city and county managers. And we put a call out for individual interviews, and we've had a lot of folks that are really interested in talking to us. And so I think it's a testament to folks wanting to engage with Dr. Cog specifically in this process and wanting to remain engaged. Um, and the need of folks wanting to come up with solutions and talk about how they can help provide for more housing uh, equitably across the region. Next slide. Um, so some of the greatest perceived needs in those first conversation, housing, uh, first level of conversations that we had, housing for low-income households and those vulnerable uh, to or experiencing homelessness as a really important key, uh, key need, uh, missing middle options uh, to better meet diverse housing needs across the region, um, housing for seniors and growing population of older adults, and housing that is close to job services and transit. One other piece that I think is worth mentioning here too is that we've heard a lot about both at the early phases of the project and continuing to hear as part of the engagement, and I think is really unique to the Denver region, is around um, the sort of long-term economic competitiveness of the region related to housing affordability. Um, it's something that is again, really unique to the policy and the culture and the conversation in Denver compared to other regions in which we work and thinking about housing competitive or housing affordability as a really important component to economic growth and economic competitiveness into the future. Okay, uh, Mr. Did you want questions now or is that okay? We do have a hand raised. Uh, Director Condo. Actually, I can wait until the end. I, <clears throat> I just figured I'd raise my hand as I had my question, but I, I'll reserve until the end. Okay. Thank Go you, ahead, Mr. Bond. Okay, um, so we've gone deeper and unpacked more in the in the additional conversations that we've had. So on the zoning, land use, and regulatory process side, um, we've heard about balancing incentives for affordable housing um, or conversion of land with fiscal responsibility. And a lot of this is how do we meet the needs of forecasting our tax generation around different land uses and land use allowances um, with housing needs. Uh, permitting processes, we've heard from a lot of stakeholders have become increasingly more uh, subjective, discretionary, lengthy, and costly, which is a real big challenge from a process standpoint. Um, we're actually hearing about the process piece being more um, of a major barrier than, frankly, the zoning piece. So, so the process being really important to address here. Uh, multiple goals are at odds and contribute to uh, prohibitive complexity. So there's lots of goals and lots of good things that folks want out of development and housing, things like affordability, sustainability, TOD, character, all of these add up to um, increasing the complexity and for the development community, increasing the risk to development happening and those that development uh, of housing uh, meeting the need of folks in the region. Next slide, please. Um, these other uh, categories here, construction and finance, uh, market forces, um, a lot of conversation around labor, materials, interest rates, you know, the um, from a policy standpoint, Dr. Cog, member governments don't have a lot of opportunity to intervene from a policy perspective on, on market forces, but there are some programmatic and policy things that um, the region, the local governments and stakeholders can think about. Um, state construction defect law driving up the cost of condominiums, uh, condos. This is an issue across the states, especially again in the West that we work with CDL, um, increasing the risk for new development for condo and ownership. Um, and costs associated with wrap insurance policies for construction defect litigation. Um, and then needing to be resilient in the face of market boom and bus cycles. Uh, you know, I've, I, I grew up in the Denver region and the boom and bus nature of the economy in the Denver region is, is something that's important to think about. How to take advantage of those uh, bus cycles to create opportunities for housing, um, doing planning, doing land acquisition, doing funding in the times um, where it's appropriate to do that so that when the, when the boom cycle comes back, um, you, the region is producing the housing um, that's needed for the, that next growth period. Um, infrastructure, prohibitive cost of adding and expanding infrastructure and working with providers to do that. Um, pressure to electrify requires capacity expansions. It can be costly for service providers and developers. Um, reliance on metro districts to pay for new and improved infrastructure, metro districts being a really important funding tool for new infrastructure and upgraded infrastructure. Um, but a, a lot of reliance on that as a tool to do that. Um, lack of a clear understanding for long-term water availability, and in many cases, inadequate transit service um, for increasing 
density and development, different housing types and different locations throughout the region. But there is also good transit service um, with part of the fast tracks investments that have been made across the region as well. Next slide, please. Um, funding and capacity, as we mentioned before, limited funds and incompatible requirements sometimes between sources. Um, seeking and managing grants is costly in smaller communities, just don't have the staff capacity to do that. Um, some of the housing providers, the, the county housing providers have been really good at stepping in to provide that capacity and support for member governments and smaller local jurisdictions to do that. Um, Needs significantly outweigh the service provisions for residents at risk of homelessness, um, specifically around funding, staffing, um, unit type for permit supportive housing. Um, the degree of critically not degree of criticality not usually weighed appropriately in determining needs. So that is, there's a lot of really high needs populations and how do we think about high needs populations in terms of meeting housing needs across the region. Um, subsidies are not deep enough. Um, affordability, affordable in terms of uh, funding sometimes is not as deeply affordable as needed in a community. Um, insufficient organizational capacity for operating and managing affordable developments. Um, and one key barrier, and I, and I think this is a really important one for a lot of communities, is preservation of existing affordable housing um, and naturally occurring affordable housing. So there are some communities that will have expiring um, tax credit affordable housing units or existing naturally occurring affordable housing within the region that is not um, has no controls over them or incentives to help support long term affordability of that naturally occurring housing. Um, collective action and political will, uh, what we've heard is a, a lack of understandings across different jurisdictions around what the need is into the future. A lot of folks know that there's a need, but lack of clear understanding of the uh, the scale of that need or where need is how to, where where housing need is across income categories. Um, sometimes opposition to growth and fear of change um, broadly at a community level, oftentimes at a project level, which is challenging from a permitting and, and a process standpoint, which we mentioned earlier. Um, and then a lack of fair share of collective will, lack of collective will and thinking about um, across the region at, at the jurisdictional level and at the submarket level, needing to meet the needs across the whole income spectrum evenly or uh, distributed across the region in different ways. Um, opportunities for Dr. Cog's role. We've heard a lot about um, how different stakeholders think about Dr. Cog specifically um, and the opportunities for Dr. Cog moving forward. Um, opportunity to, to continue to provide technical assistance for data collection, uh, provision and standardization of some of that data. Um, the data analytics team at Dr. Cog is frankly one of the best in the country that I've worked with. Um, and it's a really good asset that, that member governments um, see and want to continue on the, on the housing policy and housing planning space. Um, convener who would identify and actualize shared strategies across the region and facilitate resource alignment and partnerships. Uh, the convener, both description and role, has come up as the most frequent um, opportunity uh, talking to stakeholders um, as Dr. Cog being a, continuing to be a convener and increasingly being a convener thinking about housing planning and policy across the region. Uh, benchmarking among jurisdictions, uh, also related to that data collection piece. Um, guidance and resource sharing, research best practices, uh, providing educational and local implementation support, um, funding and advocacy being a place for regional coordinated advocacy and funding. Um, I, that's part of what happens through this, the board here and what staff and um, and and Doug here do uh, with with the policy and advocacy across the state and, and local governments. Um, consider housing and coordination with transportation planning and a funding role and create or support a regional system for subsidized affordable units. Um, it's another opportunity that's come up. We have some questions. Um, Chris, maybe before we go to the questions slide for the group, we can sort of open it up um, and see if there's, that was a lot of information that we went through very quickly. So if there's any clarifications or any questions um, from the board. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I just wanted to ask if Director Lynch had anything to add um, before we, we get any questions. I don't. That'd, be, that'd be me. I don't have anything else to add, but okay, thank you. Great. Yes. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Director Kondo. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. So my question, <clears throat> it goes back to the slide, the housing needs by submarket 2023 to 2033. And as you were presenting, I was thinking about the five barriers and one of the things that really strikes me is that if you look at the West region, doesn't seem like there are any issues. There's not a whole lot of red on top of the green bars. So now I'm just thinking to myself, 
do you have like a figure of merit for those five different barriers, a grading system mm -hmm. that you can apply regionally to each one of these five regions so that we can kind of draw some correlation as to whether it is a favorable ecosystem that would promote uh, building additional housing units, mm -hmm. or maybe it frustrates building additional housing units. I, I think about, you know, when you go to the West area, it's foothills, mountainous sort of areas. So that may not be so ideal to building a lot of high density in there. Maybe even from a fire prevention or protection perspective, it's not a good idea either. Yep. Or geographically or geologically, you know, all the hills makes it hard to build mass transit like rail and stuff like that. I'm just trying to figure out if there's a way for those five barriers that we talked about today mm -hmm to be able to grade each area by region and creating this matrix sort of thing so that you can kind of identify mm -hmm. sweet spots for building high density. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, it's a it's a great um, question. I think as we move into the strategies framework, I'm actually took a, a good note. I, I can definitely see the sort of matrix approach where we have the five barriers and the five submarkets and say, what are what are the barriers and what are the opportunities for intervention interventions for strategies across those submarkets? So, um, great comment. As we move into the strategies and the framework, I think I'll, we'll bring that into our workshop with staff and figure out how to how to think about that structured in that way. Um, on the west side specifically, you know, there there is a lot of a sort of regional uh, direction as part of Metro Vision to think about location efficiency of services and infrastructure and transit specifically um, for housing too and. And there certainly is that um, sort of natural resource um, component that's related to uh, part of the that West market as well. Um, it's just not the area where you're going to see a lot of new housing development occurring um, for lots of different reasons, from policy standpoints, from a topography standpoint, as you mentioned, um, and just from a location efficiency as part of the region, part of the region too. And Mr. Chair, may may I ask one other know. question? Sure. Um, so going back to the previous slide, the 2050 slide, I'm, I'm just trying to square the 2050 slide with the 2033 slide. Uh, it really looks like uh, even between 2033 and 2050, there's that that growing, that gap is just going to continue to get bigger. Uh, is that the takeaway? The, yeah, there's a, there's a, <laughs> yes, there's an ongoing need that if not addressed over the next 10 years, that need just gets bigger over time. Um, and that's part of the what's gotten us to this place, both in the Denver region and across many high growth regions in the West and across the country is just not building enough housing to meet the need and, and working from this place of what we call underproduction is not building enough housing in the region to meet the needs, which ultimately pushes uh, prices and pressures on more moderate income households and lower income households. So those are that are the most vulnerable throughout the region, too. So it is. Um, without being addressed, the problem gets worse over time, and the affordability challenges that we see in our communities are a reflection of, of that. Director Harrison. Thank you very much, and uh, great presentation, Tyler. I appreciate it. Um, if you can go back to the slide for the key barriers to developing and providing housing. Um, obviously, we um, I think it was collective action and political will, lack of understanding that one. Getting there. There we go. Oh, back one. One more, I think. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get there. Right there. Um, thank you. So obviously we have all these other things that we're concerned about, impactful and so forth, but it seems to me that the foundation of trying to build or, or trying to get to where we need to go is these three areas, which you did have on a slide, now you don't. But is a lack of understanding, opposition to growth, fear of change, and lack of fair share collective will. So yep. for that, how yeah. it, we, we've, been, we've been having this issue for years. What has been the as-is process, so to speak, for trying to deal with that? Where we are today and what can we do in the future to try to really, we have to solidify that first, get that message out there. What do you propose from either a government perspective or a combination of public, private communications, advertising campaign, et cetera, whatever that, that raises that level of awareness. Is there anything you can provide to that? Um, yeah, I think it, it also a great question. Man, I love coming to you all. You have such great questions and comments. Um, 
you know, it, it really is what is the next step, next phase of this project, um, what Sheila mentioned, the phase two of moving into the strategy, which is what do you do about it? And I think right, right here, what we want to get from you all is, are these categories of barriers right? Are these barriers that we're talking about and identifying and hearing from stakeholders the right barriers to move into the strategies conversation? And I think if I were to read between the lines, I, what I'm hearing from you is this is an important one. Um, yep category barriers and these three barriers are specific specifically important so what can we do as part of the strategies to make sure that we're highlighting this and thinking about dr cog's role and thinking about member government's role and other partners throughout the region um and i think that is really helpful for us to hear in terms of priorities of, of these being barriers and as we as we work into the strategies um in terms of what can you do, I think this is a really important first step. This regional housing needs assessment and defining that regional need and thinking about it um, through these submarkets, thinking about it at the jurisdictional level is a big step because it's defining across communities where the challenge is in the same language. And that's a really good big first step. Um, understanding what the barriers are based on the data, based on this common understanding, and then moving towards strategies as a phase two is the natural next place to go. I don't know that there's, I've seen a lot of things work, you know, when we get to the strategies, we can have more uh, brainstorming conversations there. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of things work in different uh, communities. I, I think the the common thread is it, it takes time and it takes political will and it takes um, community conversations and a consistent communication strategy um, from all folks involved across the region. Um but those will be good conversations that we have moving into the strategies framework after the barriers. Yeah, Sheila, the grassroots campaign is is important to that, right? Yeah. Um, one other quick question, and that was, um, and and just for awareness for everybody, when I moved here in '95, moved back to, to Colorado, you know, the the price of a home, my starter home, for instance, was two twenty five. Obviously, we're nowhere close. To 225 for people to be able to afford. Um, can you? What is the average price for, say, something at that level where somebody is wanting to get into a home that is being built? I mean, I, yeah. that's the big question because where we're here in Erie, and I think in other areas, of my fellow board of directors is, you know, those housing prices start at five, maybe six, seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars for a home. So. My question always is, well, where are those homes that are sub 500,000 are being built? Are they more on the Eastern Plains up towards Greeley in the north, you know, the Northeast part? Can you speak to that a little in terms of what that average price of home would be in order to be affordable for sellers? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't have it right in front of me. What I can say is we have in the report in the regional housing needs assessment that comes out, we have a whole lot of information in there, including this exact uh, question that you've asked across submarkets. And then we do have that information at the jurisdictional level that we're trying to figure out how to package and the best way to make that information available for folks as part of this work. Um, so in the in the assessment, we're going to have that that information for you. Um, I, I would say that there's there's two things happening. One is where's housing getting built that's affordable to moderate income or or average incomes across the region um, is one question. And the other mm -hmm. question is where is there more affordable housing that's available in the city that might be older housing or naturally occurring housing, naturally occurring right. housing. Because what we know is that the most affordable housing is housing that's been built for a while because there is what we call filtering that happens that housing gets more, more affordable over time. Theoretically, when there's enough housing getting built, that's the most important thing that there's enough housing getting built. So there's depreciation that's happening on that housing. It gets more affordable over time. Um, so there are uh, parts of the region that have a higher concentration of more affordable housing, uh, more attainable mm -hmm. housing. Um, and there are parts of the region that are seeing more attainable housing getting built. Um, and that is, uh, there's a lot of information in that report. I don't have it right in front of me right now to go over with you. Um, but I would point you to that when that that's available. Um, you know, frankly, a lot of the, when we've been doing this work and I, you know, it sounds like from the Erie perspective, which is, you know, a little bit part, partly in Boulder County, um, mm -hmm. some of the work we've been doing in Boulder County is that there's a lot of folks that are buying um, newer construction uh, right. homeownership opportunities in Thornton, um, part of the sort of North Denver I-5 corridor where there's been a lot of, of more new ownership getting built over the last few years and commuting to other job centers across the region. Um, when you look at the sub-markets that we've defined, you can start to see that playing out a little bit in terms of 
where are the affordability locations, where are the jobs, and how are folks making that housing uh, location decision based on affordability. Um, but there's a lot there's a lot of information for you in that report that'll be out as well. Thank you. We right, do thank have you. four hands up, four other hands up. Yeah, go for it. I've got Director Levy, then I'll have Director Maurer, Director Mulvey, and then Director Shaw. Uh, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but since there's so much here, um, I, I'll just ask a couple of them. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I guess I wonder about, you know, the zoning regulations always um, seems to be at the top of the list of barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder whether, you know, we've done uh, you in, in this housing needs assessment process or in some other way, you know, looked at what is the actual what the inventory of of platted lots that or, or even not platted maybe they haven't gotten to the point of platting but of of zoned residential land that is available and i i'm asking because um director baker or mr chair you may know this um i recall in some meetings with with uh commissioner warren gully um last year when we were talking about senate bill 213 her Pointing to a number of um, of available of approved building sites in Adams County, uh, Arapahoe County alone, um, that could accommodate a huge amount of growth. And so I, I do just wonder about that, and and no need for a response at this point. But I think it'd be interesting to just compare, um, you know, what the the zoned and undeveloped land that's available for that. But I think the real focus, my focus has been twofold, one at the low end of the economic spectrum and, and then at the, you know, at the 120% AMI and above. And at the low end, the 60% AMI and below, you know, the only way we're going to do this clearly is through subsidies. And we know that the amount of money that is available in the state of Colorado through all the Prop one, two, three, and all of that is just inadequate. And so then I look at, well, how are we preserving the existing affordable housing and the naturally occurring affordable housing? And, you know, just what I've seen in my community in Boulder, I live in the city of Boulder, it is a little bit about what Director Harrison was just talking about, is things that were affordable, parts of Bol the city of Boulder, South Boulder, East, East Boulder, and I'm talking about the city, um, there were uh, the source of starter homes. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much pressure now um, uh, to that those are no longer affordable. That you know the the price has been bid up to the point where you are buying what effectively would be a starter home. It it may be a, a thousand or twelve hundred square foot home, nineteen um, sixties ranch dated. But people are willing to spend seven or eight hundred thousand dollars, and so how do we? What are the tools that we have to keep those affordable? And I, I think where I go is we have to take the pressure off of those areas by building more housing that is affordable to people that are making more than AMI. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm sort of not the least likely person to be advocating for housing for higher income people. But I, I think that is putting pressure on our, you know, what used to be naturally occurring affordable. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And then I just wanted to ask one more question. Big question. Um, I, I think the sort of land capacity uh, comment question you had is something that we can talk about with um, Dr. Cog and see um, what data they have available. Um, on the production side, I think, you know, what, what we've identified here in the Denver region and, and frankly in most other, again, most other high growth uh, Western U.S. communities is that because housing production is not necessarily keeping up with need, it is putting most the most pressure on those moderate income and low income households, which are those that are going to be outbid for uh, more affordable, attainable home ownership, as well as rental um, too. And so it does help to create housing across all parts of the income spectrum and be considering what the impacts of 
even more expensive market rate housing, especially in a high cost, high demand market like Boulder is, because you will certainly create um, less pressure if you're creating more housing that's needed across all income categories. Um, that being said, you also have to think about uh, preservation from a standpoint, and, and really for rental, affordable housing rental, naturally occurring affordable housing rental, how do you prioritize for those that are renters being more um, vulnerable to displacement and pressures within the housing market as well, moderate and low income renters? So um, yeah, I agree with you. And and that's right in the research and, and across the work that we found um, in regions and cities across the West. And that it's important to think about housing production for you know, market rate housing above 120% AMI and for um, subsidized zero to 60% AMI as well. Yeah. So just the other, the other thing, I guess I'm really interested in further discussion, a lot of further discussion on is, is your slide on, on the opportunities for Dr. Cog's role and, um, you know, what, what I think House Bill 1313 is trying to do, what Senate Bill 174 is trying to do, is is address those last last two points on there housing in course uh, in coordination with transportation planning and funding and some some way to do regional subsidized affordable units you know we have all of our jurisdictions here who decided um that we were all going to try to get prop 123 monies and in boulder county we're trying to do this in conjunction with the municipalities in Boulder County, but all of us are going after this inadequate pot of money. And I, I do, I, I don't think there is a way, and I'd love to to explore a way for us to do this together um, because of that distribution slide that you have of where the need is. And some of us may be better grant writers, and so we get the money, but that's not necessarily, I'm happy for us if we get the money, but maybe it, it, it could better be used in Edgewater or someplace. So I, I really think we do need to work so much more on the regional level and and look at what tools we might propose to get that integration of transportation planning. Thank you, Director Mao. Thank you, um, and thanks for the report today. Good report. Um, I'm just gonna add on to what a couple of people have said, a couple of directors like, um, you know, what Director Condor was saying about determining, you know, when you're looking at the barriers, what levels are more you know, higher in different regions. Um, and and I guess what I, you know, work and see where I am down south, you know, in the Arapahoe County, I'm in Centennial. And yes, um, to Director Levy's point, it's like, yeah, we need to know what's zoned for it now and what is being built because we've worked on our zoning and we worked on our timelines and we've worked on all those things and it's been a struggle. <laughs> Number five on your list there, we have gone through all that and it's been tough, but we've gotten there and we're not getting things built. <laughs> very, very frustrating for us. Um, and the one thing that is the most frustrating and, you know, and, and we just recently heard a conversation about unintended consequences of construction defects mm -hmm. and the construction cost and the uninsurability. And so, um, and that doesn't look like that's going to get solved very easy. And if, even if we did make a, any, get anywhere that we're not going to see that market change very soon. So it's kind of like it, it, it kind of needs to be said instead of we keep hearing the zoning 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 thing it needs to be said okay these areas do have these places and it's zoned for this but it's not getting built why so mm -hmm. that's kind of what i was looking at so thank you very much thank you director mauer director Mulvey. hi yeah i um wanted to say uh, my own comment but i want to build on what Director Maurer said, um, I do agree that there are some reforms that need to be done um, in order to build what we've zoned for. But um, perhaps more important to me is, in my town, is that we get credit for things that we've already done, um, whether it's zone and build or just zone 
or allocate designate plan within an agreement that might not yet be billed or through an SIP. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, with respect to Director Levy, in Douglas County, we have a tremendous um, affordability attainability issue that's not necessarily Section 8 or below um, 30, 50, 40, 60 AMI. It's um, people who can't afford to live where they work. And mm -hmm. so I would echo what she stated about that. Um, my other comment um, somehow, somewhat ties into this. I was at the RTC about a week ago, maybe more, where the data underlying this was um, presented. And we have a representative from Douglas County Housing Partnership that was a part of the collaborative that reviewed the data. But I thought this body should understand a little bit of what we perceived as limitations in our county um, that may or may not help the outcome. There, the data divides up the regions into like five or six regions. And the region in which Douglas County is placed includes a large part of um, Arapahoe County, including Eastern Arapahoe County. And so these two sections of that region there's there's two big disparities. One, you know, there's some areas that are very low income or very low cost housing. And then there are other areas where there is higher cost housing and higher income. And the result is that the average housing cost that was determined for a one to two bedroom apartment about $1,700 is actually not realistic at all in Douglas County. And so someone may make more money but and reside in Douglas County, but their rent is nowhere near that average. The average within Douglas County, according to our local and regional statistics is actually much greater. The outcome of that faulty result is actually good for the county because we then get a higher allocation of um, what we may be able to receive benefits for. But I think it's worth highlighting because I, I perceive that there might be a similar issue with respect to Dudco and Jeffco, I mean, uh, Boulder and Jeffco because they're brought together as well. Um, they have the same differential. So I just wanted to highlight that. I don't know, Mr. Bump, if that's something that you can speak to now or if that's something that needs to be baked in, in large part because it's a, part of the data that may be pulled out for one purpose, but not for the overall purpose of and need for Prop 123 in the housing needs assessment. Thank you. Tyler, do you wanna try to tackle that? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's it's worth a follow up with Artie and Maria from Douglas County Housing Partners who have been involved in the work and see what they've what what their interpretation is if it's a presentation from them. I don't know that the way that we've got the housing needs identified is not really looking at average in average prices by one or two bedroom for the the submarkets. It is really looking at the census data around where needs are and forecasting those needs and where households are right now. So. Um, I can connect with them and, and see about their interpretation and um, of the information that we've provided and, and just make sure that we're all on the same page there. Thank you very much. Director Shaw. Thank you so much. Uh, I would echo some of the comments before me and the slides in this deck that basically speak to how important it is to be strategic about our planning and how a state preemption doesn't really let us be strategic. Uh, the incentives to do the right thing and build where there is space to build um, is a very strong driver, I think, in getting to success for our region. Um, I'd like to make two other points as well. Um, tax policy, federal and state, is uh, also important when we think about, um, uh, you know, if I sold my home, I would 
uh, open it up to a large family, right? Who would have plenty of space to roam. And yet, uh, if I, after I paid the capital gains tax in excess of $250,000, I wouldn't have enough to buy a new home that would be uh, appropriate, even if I'm downsizing. So, you know, that capital gains is a big problem, uh, especially if we're looking to turn over the housing stock. The, the other comment I would make is uh, you touched on the insurance uh, costs for new condo uh, building, um, which has made the, the housing product pro prohibitive to build. But I would say the old uh, housing stock of condominiums has become uh, very pricey to insure, mm -hmm. uh, both because uh, we have some in Lone Tree that's 40 years old. It was built with wood frame and uh, asphalt roofing, so vulnerable to wildfire and hail. Uh, we have made such a big deal of the wildfire um, potential uh, in so many areas, not that we should disregard it, but we kind of have gone hair on fire about it, which has given the insurance companies the opportunity to uh, make insuring these uh, common communities uh, prohibitive. So uh, I had mentioned to Senator Kirkmeyer about potentially uh, using Prop 123 money as a state reinsurance fund. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's the right solution, but we do need something to keep the condominiums that already exist affordable um, and not price them out of the market because they're just paying uh, insurance costs um, for their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shaw. Um, next up is Director Kurt. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for tackling this really monumental um, task. Housing, I think, is one of the most complex, as we're hearing from all of these very bright directors. Um, so many layers to get through. I wanted to I, I kind of pile on what a few others have mentioned as far as if we can find a way to bring this into, like bring some of the, the barriers more detailed by region. I know we're in Boulder County, so I'm in Louisville. And Louisville, for example, seems to have a higher need for what we call attainable housing versus affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And a lot, the Marshall Fire, I think, um, emphasized a lot of this. We lost you know, over 500 homes just in Louisville. A lot of them were really, you know, mid-income attainable housing prior to this. And after the rebuild, phenomenally uh, sustainable, which is a really good ad for the community and, and the whole region, however, really expensive. It also put a spotlight, I think, on the cost to rebuild a, a pretty modest, like 2,300 square foot home. This is with the infrastructure existing, just to put the home there is running $900,000 plus. Yep. So that's not to buy it, that's just to build it. And so we're seeing um, production builders put in houses and they're putting them on the market in like $1.6 million houses that literally two years ago were selling for 850,000. So I think to comment, to build on what Director Levy was saying as well, that you know entry level homes were affordable, they're not because the stock isn't there. And it, and I agree with her, it kind of seems insane that we're saying, bring in more houses for people who make a lot of money, but they are buying the houses that, that used to be affordable for so many uh, working class families throughout mm -hmm. the whole region. I also, I think it, region by region, it's different. Um, I've lived in Louisville for 27 years and seen a lot of people come into our town who said, I, I couldn't afford to live in Boulder, so I love this. I'm I'm really close. I'm in Louisville, and it's more affordable. 
And I have friends of mine who live in Broomfield because Louisville wasn't affordable and they work in Boulder. I don't have a solution. I know maybe just stating the problem over and over that we all know. I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of people don't want to live in a condo when they have, you know, two kids and two dogs. They want a townhouse or a single family home to live in. And I I want to be mindful of that when we keep talking about adding housing and adding housing that constantly adding condominiums may not help the current population that we have that needs the assistance, it may instead be bringing in people who live somewhere else because they're like, oh, look at the the great new condos in certain areas. Thank you. Thank you, Director Kern. And um, I will point out that Director Odorizio has made a comment in the chat about slides six and seven. And my comment was also about, I believe, one of those slides, the Dr. Cog area broken up in the five districts. Um, I know that that um, this is an interim report to us. And uh, if you use that um, uh, little map, there it is, the one showing the Dr. Cog area divided up into West, all those different um, areas. I'm wondering if a having, because we're going to be sharing this with others, I'm assuming, and we may know what the Southeast um, area entails, but if you could have not only a breakout of the counties, but the municipalities in each of those districts somewhere to refer to. That would be my only suggestion. Are there any other comments? I see no hands raised. Thank you very much for your presentation today, uh, both Tyler and Sheila. We appreciate it. I will, before we adjourn, I will go ahead and make the announcement again that uh, please sign up for the 2024 board retreat on April 26th and 27th. Um, we're going to be sending out a reminder of who has signed up and, and, and uh, so you'll know for sure, whether you've signed up, if you're like me, I have a very competent staff member that helps keep my calendar straight. And um, so it's always helpful to get a little list of who has signed up. So please sign up for the board retreat. Thanks. Director Rex, do you have any closing comments? Mr. Chairman, I believe uh, Director Levy does though. Okay, sorry, I didn't see your hand there, Claire. Oh, Director that's okay. Levy. That's okay. It's not a comment. It's um, a question about the retreat. I believe last year there were some rooms available, perhaps, um, if, uh, yeah, and, and parking overnight at, uh, at Dr. Cog. Uh, yes. I think when I RSVP'd, I didn't see anything about that. Is that going to be um, forthcoming? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if I may? Yes, please. And uh, I might uh, call a friend here. I might call Melinda to help help with to answer this question. I do know there are um, a block of rooms available, uh, Director Levy, at the hotel at Hyatt Centric. And uh, yes, um, you are more than welcome to park at Dr. Cog, if overnight or or just to attend the event, because I know they they uh, they have some parking over there. Uh, valet parking is quite expensive, quite frankly. It's like 50 bucks or something like that. So you're, you're more than welcome to park for free at Dr. Cog and walk the block. Okay, but we, thanks. But we Thank can make sure. Well. Melinda will follow up with you, uh, Director Levy, just to make sure that, that, um, that you have the information about the hotel stuff. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Director Lynch. Yes, thank you, Chair Baker. I just wanted to round us out by um, giving a plug for some more engagement that we are going to be doing with your member governments, with your staff in April. We are going to host two more conversations, mostly to return to local government staff to really ground truth, like this is what we're hearing, this is what we're seeing, what are we missing before we... Um, kind of round out the assessment. So uh, please share that with your staff. They'll all get announcements about it, but it'll be on April 24th and 25th. We'll do one in person and then one virtual. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I see another chat. Let me just check to make sure. Um, Tyler did say, thank you for your time today. Your feedback is really appreciated. Thank you, Tyler. You did a great job. Any other comments from any directors? Anything for the good of the organization? 
Seeing none, I see it, it is 519 and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.